What's up, everyone? Larry here. I am simply a comedy fan, chatting with and interviewing comedians, and this is Life Say Bit with Larry Mullins. Today's guest is the host of the Commissioner of Comedy podcast and also has an album titled No Segways, available now wherever you can purchase or stream music. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome James Mattern. What's up, man? How's it going? Baby, yeah, you know how it is. Let me get this old microphone right. out. Hi. Now I'm a professional. Oh, that sounds good. Can you hear me all right? Yes, sir. All what right. Up, man? How's it going? Thanks again for doing this. Anytime, fam. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I want to kind of start off with a, a general, like, generic question. This is kind of corny, but, like, how long have you been doing stand-up for those listening that don't know who you are? Or... There's good reason they don't know who I am. I am very obscure. Uh <laughs> Uh, 20 years, man. 20 years? Yeah, dude. Wow. That's I'm awesome. Lifer, bro. That's awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, that Thank that's you. two decades. Like, when you say it like that, like, that's a long time. Yeah, but, I mean, like, my first couple years, I barely got up. I yeah. mean, it, it's, I mean, there's probably, I was trying to figure it out my first year. I don't even know if I got up. I'm guessing somewhere between 15 and 20 times. So, the fact that I even, in could look people in the eyes and say I was a comedian was just despicable. Like I, I've gotten up probably somewhere between 12 and like 18 in a week one at times. So for one, my first year to only get like 15 or 20s is insane. I'm like, yo, I'm com- comedian. Ugh. But then once you started doing it like so often, then you felt comfortable saying like, Hey, this is what I do. Well, I think I still said it even before it was real comfortable. <laughs> That's the problem. I think most of us do that, unfortunately. But, yeah, I was one of them. Yeah, like back in uh, back in high school, I was in bands and stuff, and one of my friends would always say, yeah, you don't call yourself a band until you, like, play some shows and you start, like, doing a lot of He's like, yeah, you can get together and jam with your friends, you know? But he's like, until you're actually doing it, like, on a regular basis. And I was just kind of like, it was kind of like, oh, okay. It kind of made me feel like shit, but I understood, <laughs> you know? It's a good point. I was in bands, too, and I think at that point, till you play a show, the the right move is, yeah, me and some guys are starting a band. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, that's totally. the term. We're starting a band. <laughs> so, like, what inspired you to do, like, stand-up? Were you just kind of always, like, goofy with friends, or did people just always tell you you were funny and... Well, yeah, uh, I was that funny dude. It's the only way, like, uh, <laughs> I could not get beat up growing up in a lot of ways. And uh, I would say, like, raised with Italians, like, that's how you get the extra chicken cutlet on Sunday, is if you're funny. <laughs> um, apparently, I told my aunt, one of my aunts, that I was going to be a comedian when I was a kid because she was, like, fun and goofy, and we just had fun when she babysit and tell me jokes. And I'd try yeah. to write jokes, and I had no idea how to write one. I would just say horrible stuff. But she's like, okay, kid. And then I was in bands, and my bands were more funny than good. And my buddy got out of the military, and he was going to be a comedian. And so we'd hang out and watch, like, um, a lot of stand-up stuff. Yeah. And I'd show him, like, some uh, bass lines or some basic chords. And then, like, in a month, I was out of doing music, and he was uh, a musician. He was starting to – he was like, I'm going to form a band. And I'm like, I'm going to do an open mic. And no one looked look back ever since. Wow. Crazy, right? So you just went up and did an open mic and just tried some. Like, did you like sit down and like prepare prepare stuff, or did you just kind of wing it your first time? I wrote down what I thought was a ten minute. It's like almost like a performance piece, like a monologue. <laughs> I performed it in like under six minutes. <laughs> it's like when you do it, you're like, ba 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 You just end up just it's like a Ramon song, and then um. Yeah, and then I did, like, six of them. I had, like, six, like, what I thought were ten minutes. I pasted in the mirror, and um, I have maybe a minute usable in hindsight. I mean, yeah. oh, my God. But I thought I had an hour. I thought I was, like, hot shit. It was going to get an hour <laughs> written already, puffing your chest out, and you realize later it's like, oh, my gosh, it's trash. That's so funny. Uh, when uh, I actually... I'm going to jump around a little bit, but uh, something you just said triggered that that clip from your podcast that you posted recently about how important it is to have bad comedy. 
And like I saw that and I listened to it and I was just like, wow, that like hit me because like I don't know. I'm kind of a snob when it comes to certain things. Sure. I don't I mean, but and I know like I've just I've just always been a fan of stand up, you know, but I, I just listen to it and watch it. But like I know it can be subjective like music, like a band I like, another person could think, Oh, that that band's horrible, you know, but I was wondering if you could maybe like expand on that because you're right though. I mean, I wouldn't know what's good if I didn't hear some bad stuff. Well, yeah. Look, well, let me ask you, like, so what what kind of bands were you in? Like, um, what kind of music? Punk. Yeah. So you know, like, punk basically was as much as punk like loved like the Kinks and the Stooges and the Velvets and all those g- cool garage bands. Yeah. It almost was more about hating the 20 minute uh, guitar and drum solos from yes and stuff like that. And the <laughs> rock yeah. and the foreigners and that you could almost argue that like you get the pistols and the Ramones and that because they hated that stuff. Mm-hmm. They hated Emerson Lake and Palmer. So like you could do that with comedy too. It's like uh, there's uh, cause I went to school to be also, uh, I was going to be a music critic. I was oh, like, wow. All right, and so I'm into the, to that snobbery. I get mm-hmm. it. I have plenty of guilty pleasures, though. I mean, <laughs> so whatever. I'll listen to some White Snake right now, whatever. But um, comedy's the same. Like, we all want to listen to the best stuff. And then sometimes, man, hacky comedy just can anger you. Or, like, especially when you see something hacky and, like, people should laugh at what they, they want to laugh, but you see how easy it is. And then when people are arrogant about how good, good they think they are, because they're just telling people what they want to hear. That makes me want to go and just be me more. Not that I'm so something brilliant, but it's like the bad stuff makes you appreciate them. When you listen to like Richard Pryor and what he was doing in the seventies mm-hmm. or like, like Woody's albums, or you see like a young Joan rivers or anything like that, or Chappelle, just this brilliance. It just reminds you what brilliance can be. And it's like, I feel, you know, I don't really want to necessarily name names, but when I, like, there have been instances where I've, like, I've watched a special, and I, di- I, didn't, I didn't even crack a grin during it. Sure. I'm just kind of, like, sitting there, just like, um, I may chuckle slightly, but I'm like, eh. I'm like, I can't watch this. It's not doing anything for me. Yeah. Well, and it's crazy, and, and these bad specials, and we won't do names, yeah. but, like, they end up inspiring people and get used as things. Like, I have a buddy who was going to rush a special and his people were like, yo, do you want to be like that? And use the specific name of a friend of ours special. And it was like, yeah, I can't. And it became a thing where we all would, t- I mean, that, yeah. Without saying a name, yeah. someone, someone's put out a special in the last few years that has become the barometer of Yo, make sure you don't put out something like that. Wow. That's um, yeah. No names need to be mentioned. Now I'm sitting here kind of like scratching my head. Like, <laughs> what what if what have I seen recently? You know, it's funny. Like most of the most of the comics I've been lucky enough to have on here are all in, are all from New York. Yeah, and that tends to be the style of comic that I like. That's just how it's ended up personally. Sure. Um, but I've you know I I've always like I'm always I'm fascinated like the uh, behind the scenes stuff. Like I saw I saw recently. Um, but no, you're. When are you headlining at Soul Joel's? Is that is that today, or is that no, that's coming? That's a week from tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. And you you performed there recently too, right? Well, I'm here now and I'm okay. hosting. And then we got it. I was gonna try and do a podcast live on an off night, and so it gave me a Thursday. And there's like, all right, just headline. People want to see you, but who knows? I'm gonna try and record a, a question of answers because I have an album coming out of Q and A that I have no video footage so might as well just get more content to put out when it comes out oh, yeah, but we so- shall see my friend i think there's gonna be a snowstorm so that's always fun to get people out so we'll see what happens okay so now yeah i, I mentioned like the no no segues that's your album you did it came out last uh, i'm sorry i keep saying last year last year's 2020 but it came out in 2019 yes sir and you're doing a new album now or it's already done so i had a wild idea i mean i think i can talk about it now because it's already like in production um I had this idea because New York Comedy Club is my home club. Mm -hmm. And on Saturdays, you know the check spot? I realize a lot of people don't know what the check spot is in comedy. That's not like as predominant everywhere. No, I'm, I'm, you know. So 
on the road, a lot of the headliner gets checks dropped and the headliner hates that usually about like 30 to 35 minutes in their set. And they just do crowd work or new jokes or whatever Mm -hmm. in New York and other places where there's showcases before the last comic, they drop the bills. And what you usually do is you put um, a young comic to pay their dues. That's it. Like usually you'll get like, worked into a club by doing checks. And then you, if you do well in checks, they might give you a guest spot and then you do good on that. Then you can maybe get a paid spot. You, you'll go from those from getting a bunch of check spots and just getting destroyed. Cause it's horrible to a bunch of guest spots to like one paid spot a month. And you're like, I made it, but then you're getting less <laughs> stage time. But um, the check spot, you know, everyone pays their bills. No one pays attention. You will be going up there with jokes. You're doing in bar shows that crushing and you're, you're loving it. And then you get there and you get nothing. And you're like, oh, my God. Oh, it's you know what? I, I just actually – I heard that somewhere else recently, check spot. Like, literally, you go yeah. up and do your set while everyone's paying their bill really? and their tab. Oh, man. Yeah, so they got rid of that on Saturday because people, friends of the ownership, would go and notice the difference between all the comics. And it's a Saturday show. It's like yeah. the big night out. And so they started having the host do it. And I just have practice of doing that and, uh, and damage control spots. Like uh, if I host like a JFL audition, usually once the last audition is done and everyone has to pay, it's just an absolute shit show. It's ch- I mean, you might as well see people throwing babies in the air, chickens running. I mean, it's chaos. So I learned to deal with that and stretching when I have to stretch for checks or whatever, but just doing a Q and a, it's a way to get people focused while they're doing that. And I noticed I can be uh, in the pocket and react. And mm-hmm. I like to be like, you know, just going blind. It's kind of fun. It's kind of dangerous. So I just started doing those and I go, let's just record because they're set up for an album. So the idea was to record pr- probably like 20 to 30 check spots. But because yeah. of COVID, we got four. And then I'm like, let's just listen to what we have so far. And I was surprised. And so it's not going to be like a long album, but or, we're going to put out an album of me um, answering questions while people pay their bills. You can hear people talking and shit. It's cr- that's, crazy. That's kind of, that's really original though. That's it's, it's wild, man. It's fun. And it's <laughs> like, you know, I strive in this stuff. Uh, yeah. I probably have a better career if I was better, you know, actually just being a, a pure comedian, <laughs> but I, but uh, you throw me in a bad situation. I'll, I'm usually okay. So do they, are there, does every show have check spots or only certain ones? I guess it just depends on the club or where you're performing at. Not always. Like I think the seller makes people pay at the end. Some people do that. Um, some people drop slowly, but in New York city for years, it was a proper thing. And like I said, it's a rite of passage having to eat checks. Like, it, like, it, you know, and it's a way to haze out people too. Like, like I said, man, I, you puff your chest after a couple things and you think you're hot shit. And then you get a couple of those and you like, Oh, I got work to do. This isn't easy, which is good. Cause it's not easy, but yeah. we all get ahead of it. We, we put the, what the, the carriage in front of the horse a lot. So this is a way to remember the horse comes first to make it sound like it's like a hazing for a frat or something. <laughs> it's the same. Yeah. yeah. Which of course isn't awesome, but like we need a bit of it in our business. And I mm-hmm. think the podcast, I do that. I talk about a little, we, we're missing a little bit of it. I think people sometimes do think uh, they're hot shit and that they've got it figured out. And, uh, you, and no, people don't need the people who hazed me. So thank God they're not around. But we need a little step. Like Todd Lynn was a known just the worst person to us all. And we don't need that. But we need maybe light. We need Todd light. So you're thinking that all you said you're shooting for April for that? It's supposed to be out sometime. Baby, I ain't gonna lie. It was supposed to be out this week. <laughs> it was supposed to come out on my birthday. Uh, it's gonna come out in like, yeah. So I think April. Well, I'm not trying to like, you know, for you to give to give out some kind of information you're not allowed to or whatever. I was just, you know, curious. Just look for check spot. Just it'll be out sometime in the spring, probably sometime in April. So yeah. Okay, so that's the name of it. Yeah, check spots. Uh, I'm I'm really actually looking forward to listening to that. Actually, that's thank you. Brother. That's probably that sounds like one of the most original things ever. So you probably like you said you hear people talking and you're just going back and forth with everyone. Yeah, and it's <laughs> there's there's callbacks that will co- that build throughout. Mm-hmm. So it's it's an interesting experience. I think. 
the um, and it and it'll be pretty much you know everywhere you can. I put it out, man. Okay, yeah, it'll yeah. be there. Yeah, I'll, so, I put it out. It'll be there. We put it out, baby. We got. I have to uh, drive physical copy somewhere. Yeah, which um, I don't even think exists. <laughs> so uh, the how long have you been doing your podcast, and how did you come up with the idea, like the concept of? Well, so let's see. I started it. Uh, the idea. So it was kind of a joke, and it kind of goes back to like this Hazen thing, where mm-hmm. it's like a bunch of us will be in the green room and we'll see like people doing it like eight months who aren't even past for late night and they'll show up and like just control the green room and interrupt people who know each other. They'll show up with the smelliest plate of food you've ever seen and eat it next to you and they're not working there. And then they look at you crazy and we joke about how, yo man, we need like a commissioner of comedy. And I'm like, I'm going to be the commissioner of comedy <laughs> or like it, in wrestling. They'd always have like a, someone in like the, locker room who was kind of like the the dude who would keep people in line so i always joked like the undertaker was that oh yeah and so i was like i'll be the undertaker and then uh paper house network starts and uh, it's the guys from new york comedy club and they're like yo you're gonna do a podcast for us i'm like what am i gonna i don't know it's like why don't you do that why don't you just talk about that how much you love comedy and the etiquette and all that shit okay and why don't you call it commissioner i'm like okay and then then COVID happens and you're just sitting around and bored and it's the wrong time to do it. But I'm like, yeah, let's just do some, I need something to do. So let's put out a, a comedy podcast while no one in the country is doing comedy. And so we did it. How smart, huh? What a time. <laughs> no, I, 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 I love it though. It's kind of like when I, when I started this, you know, also pandemic, a lot of extra time. Like I didn't, I'm like, I've always wanted to do one, but I, I, you know, I had no idea what in the world I would talk about. And and plus the pandemic it, like has got me into a lot of like comics I would have never heard of otherwise you know what i mean like i've always listened to like the the like the huge comics yeah and then um basically just i i hear there's uh probably the first actual comedy podcast i started listening to was you know back i guess when did this shit all start in March? Probably like in June. So it's like I kind of like dove head first. I've wow. I'm, I've just basically been like a sponge sucking stuff up. But um, I'm a big fan of Tuesdays with Stories. Yeah, I and just worked with Mark last week. Yeah, I love him. But it's like any and I'm I'm not even exaggerating. Any comic that they've mentioned, I've listened to and fell in love with. That's great. So it's just like I'm I'm just discovering. You know, like. I could see, say, this comic they mentioned just perform with this comic. Oh, I'll check that comic out. I end up, it's just like a, been like a big chain reaction. And I've, that's like, I barely even listen to like the, the huge comics anymore. Like I'm just still like, kind of like discovering indie bands that I've never heard of, you know? And that's, that's exactly that's, what it is now. And that's how, and, and I love doing it that way. Kind of like, you know, uh, when you're, like when I go to search for music on iTunes or something like uh, listeners of this band also listen to this band and kind of like that, kind of like that. That's how I've been discovering everybody. I was saying, yeah, like that's kind of like, I, that's how I discover new bands, you know, same with comics, like listeners, of this person, you know, also oh, yeah. listen to this and that's how I've been finding out about everyone. And I've just been but reaching cool. out and seeing what happens. <laughs> No, but that's fun. It, it is fun that it's gotten to that now. Like we come back, you know, you and I were like in, in music and punk and, and indie and whatever, alt, whatever you want to call it, like yeah. music. And now we are, we're comics and it's become like that. There's elements of that. It's kind of fun. And yet you don't have to be the biggest act anymore to have people into you. You could just do your little podcast. Doesn't have to be the biggest thing ever. You can put out your records. You can put out your own clips. There's a lot of DIY now in comedy, which is fun. And there's, you know, I guess nerd is empowered now. It's like the comedy nerds. It's great. You can be like, like the, the internet is what like going to a record shop used to be. We can just go and find people and discover people and binge people. It's really dope, man. Yeah. It's I, been uh, great for our business, for our industry. It's been wonderful. I like um I like the whole DIY aspect. And you just like you mentioned uh just record shops. Like you know, I've 
like, I don't know, about two years ago, I finally bought a record player and going to an actual like record store. I was like, I was in love. I was like, oh, this is, I was like, this is amazing. I must have spent like two hours just looking through stuff. It feels good, man. It's so weird. I was talking to someone about this. I feel a lot of people don't care about discovering anymore, which is weird because we got like these things and we can just discover anything at any point. And people don't want to get out of their own way and like learn. I just remember going to a record shop or even like a virgin or a tower and just spending hours and you maybe wouldn't buy nothing, but you'd like look at the cover and then like, you'd be like, Oh, this look cool. And then you talk to someone about it and they tell you how cool that band is or no, they're shit, but you should check out them. And it was just a cycle of learning and just like, like you talk about being a sponge, man. I, I've been that with anything I'm into. I, and, and I yeah. just feel like as an artist, we should take from anything you can. Why, why deny something that could make you feel good a and B that you could learn from for your own shit. And I, you know, I like that. I like that you go in there. I, I might go to a record shop tomorrow. Shit, man. <laughs> well, I remember um, back in the day, uh, I would go to, and it's it's closed down. I mean, this is like over ten years ago, but about thirty five minutes from my house, there's a Tower Records, and I would go oh, there yeah. probably once. And I I would love. I wasn't really the biggest fan of their prices, but like their CD sure. selection, their movie selection, like they had everything. And then like chances are I could find some indie bands album at, at Tower Records. You know, they would carry it over. You know, they just had, they just had, I, it was almost like a field trip going there. You know, it was like a special thing. I used to go Saturday afternoon, man. And then when I, <laughs> one of the last ones that was in Vegas where I'm from would stay open till like midnight and it was across the street from where I was waiting tables and it would just mean the world to go there. Horrible weekend and show up on a Sunday. Go, you go to the listening station, throw in the headphones and sample albums and maybe I leave with a book or something or, or an uh, import magazine that you're paying way too much for but they care more about the shit in England than they do here. Yeah. So you can go and pay like... 15, 20 bucks. They, I mean, they, yeah, they had posters and everything. I remember literally I would spend at least an hour in there. Like I would oh, look dude. at literally everything. Some of my favorite memories are loitering in record shops. And then when I moved to New York, there was that Virgin mega store in Times Square. And I spent so much time and man, they didn't have bean bags. You would lay on a beanbag and read and, and probably probably got three different strains of bed bugs, but <laughs> it just felt great, man. And you just kill time there. And then they had a virgin store on 14th Union Square, and that was even doper. It was just the best, man. You just get lost in there. And you left feeling like you even though you were doing nothing, you left feeling like you did something. Like you put yeah. something into you. Yeah, like we had um the mall by me at least. I guess up until, I mean, I, I mean, late 90s, early 2000s, there was like uh, Sam Goody. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember back in the day, I mean, I, I was really little, but I remember, did you ever hear of this uh, music chain called Waxy Maxies? No. It, a, but I just remember. The name. No, it was, there was, <laughs> there was this, uh, yeah, I vaguely, I was, it was, I think they closed down probably in like, like right before 1990, like late eighties. And, uh, I remember when the CDs first came out, they were super expensive and the jewel cases were inside of this like cardboard thing. Oh yeah. This this long, this long, tall cardboard thing. And, uh, I actually did wanted to want to ask you, cause I saw when I asked you where you're from, cause I saw you, uh, wearing a Raiders hat. Yeah. Yeah. Dog. And, uh, there it is. I, um, I actually have, I've, been a fan I like I live in Virginia so I mean naturally I like Washington we won't talk about Washington but I've always I've always rooted for the Raiders when they play so as long as I can remember uh the first oh. time I saw him play is when Bo Jackson was on the team mm-hmm. that's the first time I remember watching on TV but um the day after Christmas my cousin and I flew out to Vegas and that was my first time there ever this oh, pa- yeah like literally this past Christmas right yeah now. And um, we went to the stadium. It's, it's unbelievable. And went into the store. That's where I, I got it. I got this hat and I got a shirt. I'm like, I have to buy something. I have to. Like I, you know, it's the first time in Vegas. It was wild. I didn't know you could just walk down the street with an open container. It's I didn't kooky. like. Yeah, it's, it's easy. Yeah, I was like, this is so weird. You know, uh, 
It was fun though. Did a lot of walking. It's just we were there for like four nights. Yeah, yeah. Where'd you uh, stay, dog? Uh, Paris, the Paris Hotel. Oh yeah, that's a fun one. Yeah, it was uh, I was kind of like, and the weather was decent. It was like it was like high fifties. It wasn't like cold, but it wasn't really warm either. Well, baby, the fifties sound good to me, right? I just ran, and it <laughs> the wind chill. It was like sixteen out here, so yeah, uh, I will. Uh, t- I can't wait for fifty again. Yeah, it's like the it's like the it's like the I think high twenties today here. It's Yuck. cold. Yeah, I just uh, Vegas was just man. Like I and we walked by the Laugh Factory out there, and I'm like, yes. we were like, you know, oh, I said if there was somebody that I've heard of um, performing, I'd be like, hey, let's go, you know. But and it just it's like all the because I've always like, man, I never thought I'd be able to go to Vegas because I'm just like, you know, I I just never thought I'd be able to. Like I'm single, I go with my cousin, he's married, but it's like. I've always, I'd always see Vegas on TV. I'm like, man, I want to go there someday. And it was and just. He went in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. You'll be able to brag about that forever. My first time, it yeah, was half running. <laughs> it was, you know, it was, it was just crazy being, you know, the, the showgirls walking up and down the streets. Like, yeah, do you want to take a picture? And, you know, so. Oh, they still, man, people still hustling in my hometown. <laughs> see, this is the first time I didn't go back for years for Christmas. And it was wild. Some, uh, you know, I only got um, some guy only tried to sell me drugs once. Well, that ain't long. All which right. you know, you but uh, yeah, but I was just like, this is this is crazy. I remember like, you see, he literally said, "Yeah, it's wild out here. Like, it's almost like the wild wild west or something." Like this one, the 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 first set of showgirls we saw, like literally, you know, they're normally dressed in like the glittery stuff, the shiny stuff, and these two girls yeah. like had their boob boobs painted they weren't wearing anything on their chest they were just fully painted and i was just kind of like speechless i'm like it's is that and he's like yeah man you see that all the time i was like oh my god oh you were at fremont fremont's a whole nother thing man so (laughs) since you're like an old rock kid man um you walk around the fremont experience it kind of feels like a primus video in the 90s (laughs) it's just like one shot and anything happens kind of like just like a check spot gone even worse but yeah, with alcohol and people walking around Fremont, you will see that there'll be people trying to get you to donate to a uh, charity. Oh yeah. Shaking. Mm-hmm. You get to, yeah. What charity is that? Um, it, it's pure insanity. It's pure in that area used to be the worst part of town. And still, when you get off, it is still a little bit. It's kind of like the lower East side in New York, like 30 years ago, where you could see a cool band go to a dope bar but then two feet outside, you can get stabbed by a prostitute over uh, 10 bucks that they need for rock. It's really wild. It's <laughs> it's so crazy to see. But it's, that used to be the whole area. I mean, honestly, like I could have, I would have been fine just like staying in the hotel because the hotel was fun, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. But I'm like, no, we, I want to walk around, you know? We went and went to where the, the Welcome to Vegas sign is. Sure. And we walked all the way back to our hotel from there. Like we Ubered there and then just walked back and just a lot of sights and just seeing it lit up at night is just, it's something I've always wanted to see in person. Yeah, it's crazy. And um, I went back, I was there for most of the shutdown and I was there for them opening it back up Mm -hmm. phase one and two in the weekend before they opened up the people I was staying with, we, we drove down the strip because I heard that and I would see it on social media. It's people talking about, going down the strip when there's no one there. And it was crazy. And I grew up there and going down there and only seeing a handful of people who are still acting like maniacs and the strips kind of dark. And it was so exciting. I felt like I was in a goddamn John Carpenter movie. It was so <laughs> wild. Oh. It, it was gave me a new perspective of where I'm from. And then I, I saw it again when they started to open again. It was crazy. Yeah, I can't. When everyone just pretended there's nothing going on. It's hilarious. It was just like, hey. Want to sip from my cup? No, man. Yeah. <laughs> we still got a little bit of this, dog. What does it matter with you? Yeah, the uh, it was. I mean, for the most part, everybody was responsible. For what I noticed, sure. you know, I mean, I I wore my mask when I was outside and walking by someone, and then when there was nobody around, I just kind of had it hanging off my ear when my cousin and I were talking to each other, you know. But 
I mean, some people, of course, were, like, acting wild. Then again, I mean, everything was wild there to me because I had never, you know, I'd smell weed and 10 feet up, there'd be a man and a woman walking with their little kid. And I'm just like, this is, this is crazy. (laughs) You get it all there, man. You get it all there. Saw, you know, I saw a few arguments looking like fights were about to break out. Just because oh, one yeah, person yeah. was just super drunk or fucked up or something. And and I didn't see a lot of that, but I saw a few of them just spread out throughout the week. <laughs> yeah, and that's when it's not full blast. Just wait till you go there and Vegas is back to Vegas. You can see all that shit. When it's like not even Fights during. all over. I just think of how, how crazy it was during a pandemic. I can only imagine like when it's normal. Brother, I used to wait tables on the strip and... I was told that if someone doesn't pay their bill, shake them down. I followed someone into the casino, sweating them. While they, they, went, they didn't pay the bill. They went and started playing blackjack, and I'm just hovering over them in my uniform. It's like, yo, you going to do this? Uh, I followed them into Carrot Top, into Carrot Top at MGM. <laughs> um, guy was like, all right, we'll, we'll get the money. Come on in. Come on in. Come on. We'll get you in. Come on. Come on. We got to go. That... I followed them across the street to Caesars once. Uh, I'm like, yo, dog, you want to pay this or what? And I'm by myself. I don't have security half the time. A couple times I did. And it's like, what am I going to do? Am I going to fight this dude from, like, Texas in the middle of the strip? Wild thing. And no one blinks an eye at this. This is just things that happen. Just, just, yo, son, you're going to pay or it's going to get real ignorant. Well, so they just, like, ate and then just walked away. And they're like, yeah, go, go make them pay their bill. Just split, and it's like, oh, all right. Or it comes out of your ass, and like you get like two or three of them in the union, you're out. It's like, nah, that ain't me. I'm, I gotta save up money to go to New York and uh, eat potato chips for two years as a, as a supper. So <laughs> you would just you would run after these people. Wow. And then, and then like I was working at Margaritaville, that would become like a club mm-hmm. at night, and the shit would just the fights you would see. It's insane, and you'd have like crazy managers. Who like were old military dudes smiling while well, it's like a dog pile with like lollipops and just like cracking their knuckles. It's like, what are you, what are you gonna do? Your management. It was wild the shit you would see. You'd be delivering margaritas and then just see two girls just pounding each other because they are or arguing over which Jay-Z song the DJ should have been playing. It was insane. My hometown, oh. baby. All I was, you know, all I was really doing is I you know, I'm, I'm not a very, I'm not super like lucky with women, but we'd be in the casino in the hotel and I'd just be kind of like, you know, just scanning the room, you know, just looking, you know, uh, I've, I kind of keep to myself, you know, um, my cousin was wearing a, uh, wearing a, a Nipsey Hustle hat, the rapper, and uh, yeah. we, we were walking down the sidewalk, and this guy was trying to, like, get us to buy his, like, mixtape or whatever, or his sure. CD and stuff, and I was like, oh. And he's like, oh, man, you got to be down with the black people because of the hat. And I was like, oh, Jesus. I'm just like, oh, I'm like, let's keep walking, let's keep walking. And he was just laughing, but I'm like, man, I saw all kinds of stuff. Like, I never felt threatened when we were there. It was just, it was just crazy. It's an ongoing hustle on that strip, man. It's always <laughs> going to be. There's always someone buy my mixtape. Yo, buy this goldfish. This goldfish is lucky. If you buy this goldfish, you're gonna hit all the keno and all your your football bets this week. It's always some shit or the little dudes trying to give you the cards for the hookers. I mean, everyone is just working nonstop hustle on that strip. Cards for the hook. So maybe that is what I saw. That's probably what you. So what they. So saw. what they. They're like. They. It's like just little, like almost like business card type deals. They're just like handing them out. None of these guys speak any English at all. So if you ask them any questions, they don't know nothing. They're just. <laughs> they and they have them all, st- and they make that wonderful sound of <laughs> with the cards and just handing it to you. And they'll be like naked girls with like the nipples zipped out and a phone number. And that is numbers to call when you're in your hotel room. Wow. And it's not legal. It is not legal. But just like drinking on the street ain't legal. It, it really isn't. But uh, it is explained to me by cops in that is if you act a fool and you got a drink in your hand, they'll handle business. But if you just doing your thing and drinking, we see nothing. But it's a way then 
to keep other things from escalating. If they see someone hooting about and screaming and looks like they could be a problem and they got a drink in their hand, you know you're not supposed to do that, right? Oh, oh. What else? Yeah, and then <laughs> who knows what else happens after that, but they use that as a thing. Sometimes it, they don't look that way. I get what you're saying. So, yeah, for the, like we were just minding our own business, you know? So, because if you're so just if you're peaceful for. and you're just walking, drinking whatever, they're not going to bother you. Yeah, man. Just be chill. Just handle your business. I always wondered, like, like, is this actually legal? Like, it can't be. It can't actually be legal, you know? But I guess they yeah, just kind of like. changed it since I've been gone. Yeah. But yeah. like New Orleans, legal. So Savannah, it's li- Georgia, legal. So it's literally legal in those places. You goddamn right, buddy. <laughs> they're like, oh, they're they're probably like, oh, we have bigger fish to fry. If that that guy's just walking down the street drinking a beer and not doing mm-hmm. anything, it's gonna keep driving. Yeah, as long as you chill. Yeah. But like it's in, in some of these southern places I mentioned, you'll leave a bar mm-hmm. to go to, walk to another bar. And you'll stop to pick up a roadie somewhere else. It's just the culture. I went to New Orleans once because my old roommate was doing a, the Comedy Central half hour. And my, my dear friend Yamanika was filming that day too. And I was off. And I was like, yo, whatever. And I wandered around. And I got, t- I mean, I don't drink like this. I don't day drink usually. And also, I don't drink slushy, sugary shit. I like my sugar. I like my alcohol. I don't like them together. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, why not? And I got... I went through two or three of those big ass things. Oh yeah. Oh, this is like a mudslide. Just walking down Bourbon Street, walking down Frenchman, it was insane. And I grew up in Vegas. I'm like, this is the greatest thing ever. I was drunk probably three or four separate times that one day. <laughs> oh, I love it. So, did were you able to? Um, I guess how do I say this? Were you able to? When you started out, like, when you started comedy, were you already in New York, or did you start when you were in Vegas? In Vegas. Okay. Five years. Okay, so you you did it in Vegas for five years while you lived in Vegas, I mean? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. And did some road gigs in Cali and all that, yeah. Okay, so. Arizona. I saw, and I thought that made my career, so that's another thing. It's like when I got to New York, you know, I've done road work. I mean, what did I do, like 15, and maybe three of them were good, four of them were good. Just go into like really small towns and get your teeth knocked out. <laughs> um, and when I mean, are you are you liking? Uh, the, I mean, I've I've always like seen. I know like the New York Comedy Club does all those like outdoor rooftop gigs, yeah. and like I I still like I want to come to New York and go to one of those because like they just look super fun, in my opinion. They just look like they're a lot of fun. They have been pretty great. I did one before I uh, left. Um, last week, last Thursday, 18 people spread out cold ass night Mm -hmm. and it was just magic and it felt good. And the lineup was good. Um, a lot of people who are going out now are just appreciative of anything. And a lot of comedians are happy that there's anyone there. So there's a good energy. Now you get, you get a few people who just show up and uh, you don't know why they did it. They're not trying. They're not taking, uh, they're taking it for granted. And there's some comedians who are taking this rare stage time that we have for granted, but Mm -hmm. uh, usually people are in good moods and are just excited to tell jokes again. And, and that, and people are excited to hear things and realize that this is as horrible as this is, we're doing the best we can. And we're going to look back and find some good things in this horrible situation and be like, yo, it's kind of cool, man, going to comedy outdoors, the comedians. Uh, there's people with specials and TV shows talking to you on a roof that looks like where, where, where <laughs> Commissioner Gordon should be, like, putting the light out for <laughs> Bruce Wayne and shit. Yeah. I um, Since I've only been to, like, one in-person show since the pandemic started, and, that, and it was indoors, but it was it was responsibly – yeah. Like distance and everything. Uh, it was the Arlington Draft House. Always heard good things about that place. Okay. So, so you've heard of it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it, yeah. It, it, it was cool. I mean, it was cool. Uh, you know, it was the, they have like um, the stage and the first four rows of seats right in front of the stage were all blocked off. Then they had kind of like this bar type deal, um, kind of like, like you're, I guess, kind of like sitting at an island in a kitchen or something with like a 
chair or something. Yeah. Then they uh, sat there. They had uh, chairs grouped in twos, separated by big tables with an X on them. And they had spaces where groups of, like, larger groups could sit together. I mean, it was, I feel it was done pretty responsibly. It was fun. But I want to go to one of the outdoor ones. <laughs> yeah, outdoors are really good. What's crazy is I did, like, three shows when I was in Vegas, indoors. And I told people when I got back, man, of the three things I went to, I, I went to some bars. I went to, to eat as things were legal. And the safest I felt were the comedy shows spread out. And then as you learn, you know, like when you, I get tested when I get back to New York every time from, mm-hmm. from performing out here and they, it's always, okay, why are you here? Did you come in contact with someone with COVID? No. Um, did you talk to someone up close without a mask for 10 to 15 minutes? No. Do you need this to go back to work? Yeah. Okay. But, but that's the thing. It's the con and I, I played indoors in AC this week. It was weird. It, since Vegas, I have a, a roof. Holy shit, a roof! <laughs> and they spread out everything beautiful. They had booths. I mean, you you had to get a if you had more than like two people, you had to get a booth it, that was away from everyone else. And and I think there's ways to do it. And you know, I don't think people are going table by table spitting on each other. I you know, know it, definitely not. <laughs> but I get it. I get people's fear. Obviously, we we need to do this everything as safe as possible, and that's why. The outdoor shows are so great, and it's been really innovative. I mean, some of this stuff's insanity, mm-hmm. but uh, like I said, I, I'd be shocked if we don't use some of this going forward, doing more rooftop shows in the summer and the spring and in the early fall. And park shows were hit or miss, but, man, when the park shows were good, you left happy. You were like, shit. And, and like, I did the subway show. Everyone kept their mask on. Everyone, even the performers, and it was tough, but you left going, shit, if I can get laughs in a subway, and if people wanted to laugh in a subway, my goodness. Yeah, that's 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 definitely one of that's definitely the most interesting one I've seen pictures of. It was insane. For but sure. I, I kinda like it. <laughs> I mean, and the next time I do it, I might get beat up. Like I might, you know, it might be horrible. But I also think you do it enough times you're gonna learn a rhythm to how uh-huh. to get better at it. Well So um, I'm intrigued by that. You know, because I just love it so much. Let's go. <laughs> totally, man. Uh, well, I guess uh, that's really all I have. We'll go ahead and uh, beautiful. wrap up. I uh, wanted to tell you this. Will, because um, I'm still fairly new and there's still not like a, I still don't have like a massive audience. You know what I mean? Sure, buddy. But uh, the this will be out Friday. Uh, what's the first Friday in March? Uh, March 5th. Yeah. So, Friday, March 5th. So, do you have anything you need to plug, like, date-wise? I'll be with Chrissy D, but that, that thing's going to be sold on its own, brother. Um, no, nah, man, it's great. It's great. That's good. Uh, I got a thing coming out August se- or April 2nd. Mm-hmm. New York Comedy Club's releasing, like, three comedians with a band. It's called Sessions. So, man, if you want to slide that in, cool. I got oh. a song. I was, like, the first one to record. Awesome. It's me and a band. <laughs> Christina Hutchinson did something. Matt Richards. All three of our tracks are completely different from each other. That's so, cool. And I think we all have musical projects we're working on after. So, <laughs> of course. Awesome, man. Well, it was great to meet you virtually. Brother, and... pleasure. This is great. All right. Thank you so much again. Have a great one. We're right on, brother. And just you know, hit me a link on that day and that too, man. We'll I will. I will. Appreciate you, it. Dog. Appreciate it, man. No problem. My pleasure. Be well, bro. Later. All right. That concludes this week's episode of Life Save It with Larry Mullins. Please follow the podcast on all social media at Life Save It Pod. If you are listening, please follow, rate, subscribe, and write a review. If you're watching on YouTube, please like, comment, and subscribe, and tell your friends. While you're at it, please follow James on Instagram at the James Mattern and on Twitter at James L Mattern. Also, check out his podcast, The Commissioner of Comedy, available wherever you get your favorite pods. And purchase or download his album, No Segways, available wherever you can purchase, download, or stream music. Thank you so much for the support, and I'll catch you on the next one.